We're going to finish up four tonight, get into five. We won't go through all of five, but most of five we will. <clears throat> and then um, we'll save the, the end of five for next week, as long as we have class anyway. I missed having class Sunday. I miss some of you being here Sunday. But I'm glad you were careful Sunday. <clears throat> Our online numbers, the people who watch online, most weeks is around 300, 300 devices. So uh, I have a formula that I kind of calculate to figure out how many are on. Uh, and it's about one and a half people per device. So this week we had almost 700 online watching. So that tells you there were a lot of people. We had 543 here who braved the parking lot and the cold temperatures. And but we had a great day Sunday, but we missed some of you as well. So that, that's just the way it goes sometimes. And I want you to be safe. We don't need any more broken hips or arms and elbows. Like a, a crazy person, I, I pushed my son and grandkids down the street the other day, and I wanted them to go real fast. And right at the end, I pushed, and then I tripped. And I hit, hit my elbow, and I thought, oh, that wasn't a good idea. So I need to listen to my own advice sometimes, though. That's the way. That's the way it goes. Uh, overall theme tonight is uh, high priest or the great high priest, and we're going to talk about Melchizedek. But he's going to be in several chapters that we go along here on, but pretty well on priesthood. And so that's the that's kind of the main focus uh, this week is Jesus is part of a great. He's a great high priest. There's uh, no other great high priest. There are high priests, but he is the great high priest, and there's none like him. And so we, as uh, Christians, put all that together and realize just how blessed, what a good opportunity it is, what a great blessing to have a high priest like Jesus. And so don't get discouraged. Don't give up. Things are tough. It will feel like the world is against you like it did in the first century. Uh, things will get difficult, but look at the bright side. Look at the good, good side. Look, look at what God is doing, and that, that's the real key thing. As we talk about priesthood, uh, in the Old Testament, there were obviously uh, God, under the law of Moses, planned for priests and high priests and all those regulations. Before the law of Moses, there were no priests, so to speak, other than like Melchizedek. Uh, sometimes it was really kind of, uh, they represented themselves to God. God represented himself to them directly. But Moses, under Moses' law, that changed. And obviously, in the new covenant, that changed as well. And Christ is our high priest. And I say all that to think, it reminds me that unless you're reading through the Old Testament, you're in Leviticus right now, you kind of forget about what priesthood and that representation is all about. Now, as Christians, you and I are royal priests. We are a part of a royal priesthood. And so maybe talking about priesthood and some of those things will spark a little thought in your mind and think, put you through the thoughts of, of thinking uh, because to a large extent I feel like in, as Christians we kind of are like there are no priests today, that type of thing uh, and we forget that we are part of a royal priesthood uh, but we uh, you know we fight denominationalism where there are priests and that type of thing so we we uh, we kind of put that on a back shelf, and we don't think about how there are a connection between God and us. There are these priests that 
that uh, do certain things. Obviously, we go directly to God as priests under the new covenant. So, anyway, that's just a little bit to get the, the wheels spinning, hopefully, in your mind and thinking about priests. Uh, the Hebrew writer brings it up to, just again, to remind us of the great high priest we serve. So, Frank's going to read chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. And then we'll pause and talk about that. This list is going to be under the uh, heading of the high priest. Our compassionate high priest, that's what I'm trying to say, our compassionate high priest. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness but was with all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. All right, I like that word boldly. We can talk about that a little bit at some point. Uh, so what stands out to you guys when you read that? Confidence. Confidence. Okay, they're in verse uh, 16, yeah. And I think that's probably where the King James uses the word boldly. Let us come with confidence. Come to his throne of grace with confidence. Help in our time of need. Okay. Uh, yeah, there at the very end. Help, help us in our time of need. You guys ever have any needs? I mean, Every day, yeah, yeah. Someone who understands my struggles. Someone who understands my struggles. Isn't that true? It's, it seems uh, when you put together the thought that God is perfect and uh, and we struggle, uh, the thought that a priest that could empathize with our weaknesses, our struggles, um, and honestly, sometimes how we view God as a, as a father is how we viewed our own father or how we learned fatherhood through our own father or lack of father in some cases. Um, we all have uh, different experiences. Some, sometimes fathers are not very forgiving. I, I, I think I've probably told you guys before, but I haven't told it in a long time if I've told you. When I was a, a teenager, you know, you're pretty confident in what you do and and I'll let my dad have me drive in tractors before I could really do much and uh, couldn't even move the pedals and stuff sometimes when he had me running them. And one time I, uh, it was before I had a driver's license, but we were driving in the country and that just sounds really bad now, but it was back in the time, you remember. We all did, we all did yeah. Uh, but anyway, one day I was on this uh, UM and M. That was, it's kind of like it had the front tires were real close together and the back tires on them. They were wide. And that tractor, it had five gears. And in fifth gear, it would go 35 miles an hour. So, uh, and it had a hand clutch. And, you know, I've been driving tractors for a long time, but I got on this time and I probably had it in fourth or fifth gear, but, you know, I pushed the throttle forward and pushed the clutch and I was standing up. And you know what happened? Yeah. yeah, I can't run 35 miles an hour, <laughs> and it's just going everywhere, and I'm chasing it, and it ran into the stock trailer and went on it for a while, and, and then it got off, and it was, then it ran over the stock tanks that were full of water, and the water was going everywhere. You can just picture me chasing this tractor, and there's this big cliff. And I'm thinking, it's going for the cliff. <laughs> but it turned. And I finally got on it and got it stopped. And I thought, okay, how do you explain this to your dad? <laughs> Did you have to tell? <laughs> he was going to find out. But he was driving a tractor at another place a mile or two away. So I, I, I thought, wow. Of course, I was shaking. And I thought, i got to go tell him. So I came and told him. And his question was, are you okay? 
And that was the first time I, in my life I figured out my dad really kind of does value me. I think he likes me. Because <laughs> I thought everything else was more important than me. I just want worse there. Yeah, go ahead. This, this is, this is, this is, uh, this, this is Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. <laughs> yeah. Let us take mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. Well, and that, that uh, did change my life drastically, the fact that my dad treated me that way, because I thought I did damage to the stock trailer, the stock tanks, and uh, all kinds of things, you know, and, and the, the water thing, we'd fill up the stock tank, it bent it over too, so I thought, <laughs> this is bad. But uh, God does understand us, and he does, he is there. Wiley? What if we don't? Approach the throne of grace with confidence. I, uh, I I think as long as we approach the throne of grace, even if we come fearfully, I think that that's a good thing. <clears throat> but we do need to we'll be rewarded with these good measures, these benefits. If we don't, if we aren't confident when we yeah. offer the prayer to Him. I, I think we do, although James, you know, said we should ask in faith without doubting. Uh, but the, the reality is when we have it all in, in the right perspective, we can come to the throne of grace with confidence, boldly. Uh, but and God will. That don't. Yeah, and it's unfortunate. That's why I was kind of saying the Father that we picture God the Father as can hinder us from approaching him in a confident way. But if we really understand who God is, we can't approach that way. Fred, and then we'll come back to Harley. Go back to the first high priest. Yeah. And he was speaking to God in the tabernacle on behalf of the people. This is a guy who just got through saying, I threw the gold in the fire and this calf came out. Yeah. How much confidence would you have in a high priest like that? <laughs> yeah, good point. Okay. This is the priesthood of all believers. Say that again, the first part. We're part of the priesthood of all believers. Uh, are all Christians priests? Yes. Okay, yes. Because you contradicted yourself a little while ago. Uh, you said something about the priesthood was a royal priesthood, which is true. But there's a few other scriptures that he has made us priests. Right. And we can go straight to uh, God, a holy priest. Right. Under the old covenant, we couldn't. In the new covenant, we can. Because Jesus is our high priest and has opened up this ability for us to uh, be able to approach God directly through Jesus, the high priest. So, uh, so we have this great high priest, and I think that's interesting that it's great. We have this awesome, we have this powerful, uh, we have the best high priest that there ever, could ever be. And instead of going into the Holy of Holies, he has entered into heaven, heaven itself. Jerry? When you stop to think about who, when this was written, who it's written to, these people had a Great, they knew what a priesthood was. Mm -hmm. For Jesus to become not only just the priest but the high priest, the law had to change. Yes, because back then the only ones that could be priests or high priests were Levites. Right, from the tribe of Levi. Yeah, and Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. So that's why he is now a high priest because the law changed. His law. Right. And. Uh, I think sometimes we think, uh, maybe we forget that he's been tempted in every facet of life like we have. Right. Yeah, without sin. Uh, uh, I know a lot of times we like to think of Jesus during his ministry. And, yeah, we say, yeah, I know he's the son of God, but he's also a part man. And uh, when we remember that. He was not only tempted just before his ministry, his priesthood vision, but all during the ministry. 
and uh, that should give us some confidence that well, if he can get through this, with his help, I can get through this. Yeah. And that's, that's why we can uh, then boldly come to the throne. Very good, very good. Uh, it says, let us, when you talk about let us, I may have to make a list of the let us in that at some point, but let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Now, that's not only just our, our faith, but it's also the system of faith that we profess, that we teach. Uh, if we are a royal priesthood, we need to uh, hold firmly to that and think about that. We don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weakness. We, Jesus understands he can, like you're talking about, Jerry, he was, he was tempted in all points like we are, yet was without sin uh, in every way. Um, and, I, you know, all of us can probably make the exact thing. Well, he was never married, so he was, wasn't tempted that way. Well, he was tempted in every way nature of all those things. Maybe not specifically like you are, but I think if we're honest and we understand what the scriptures are saying, he was probably tempted to a greater degree than any of us in any of those places. Uh, so we should, he did it, so we should be able to not give up. Don't give up. Uh, he did it without sinning. He was tempted, but he didn't sin. So let us approach that throne of grace with confidence. He's our mediator. He's our, uh, the spirit is our intercessor. He is, he's there for us. He understands us. And the fact that he did that is very different. We can come boldly, confidently, strongly before the throne of grace because we've received that mercy and uh, we've all been in need, haven't we? So it's, it's, it's a daily thing. And we should make it uh, more than just daily. We should, we need thee every hour. And we should, we should pray every hour. Yes? Also in James, it says you got to pray without doubting. So that's part of that confidence that you right. have when you're, when you're approaching God. You cannot doubt or you can't expect to receive anything. Mm -hmm. So that you got to have confidence. Yeah, we we're, we're trusting Him. It's our ultimately our faith is in Him. Our faith is not in our faith, but our faith is in Him. Our faith is in the Great I Am. And when we that's why we have to understand who God is, so we 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 gain that confidence and trust. And faith in him that he will do that. So, all right, we're going to go to chapter five. Doug's going to read for us one through five, and then we'll pause and talk about that a little bit more. Every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to sympathize with the untaught and the misled, since he himself also is beset with weakness. And because of it, he is obligated to make sin offerings for himself, even as for the people. No one takes the honor to himself, but he who is called by God, even as Aaron. In the same way, Christ also did not glorify himself to be a high priest, but the one who spoke to him, you are my son. I have begotten you today. All right. Thank you very much. I'm looking for the word, there we go, verse 4, called. Called by God. Uh, the beginning priests, obviously, were uh, the Levites, and it was kind of passed down. The high priest was the, the oldest son of the firstborn. It was just the firstborn after the firstborn after the firstborn. So who continued to do that? Uh, I kind of think of, of of England and their kings and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
But that's the way you became a priest. You couldn't just say, I'm, I'm going to be a priest. God put into place a system and it, it just continued down that way. Jesus is an exception to that under this new priest. He's a high priest for God called him directly and once and for all times. It didn't it wasn't to continue on his oldest son and, and on and on. Jesus, we're going to realize as we go through Hebrews that he was a priest. His sacrifice was once and for all time. His, his sacrifice was great enough that it lasts forever uh, because it was the blood of Jesus and it, he was the high priest. So, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent people in matters related to God. So there's this connection, this, this uh, mediator role between God and people, and Jesus was perfect for that because he was the complete man and the complete God all in one. Gary? Didn't the high priest have to be a descendant of Aaron? Priest, um, priest could be any Levite, but the high priest, right? Didn't he have to be a descendant of Aaron? I think that's right. That's my understanding. So, uh, not just any Levite could say, "I'm going to be a high priest." Right? Are you a descendant of Aaron? No. Well, then you can't be. Right. Uh, God put that system, and that system had to continue on. And I mean, He didn't change that system once He put it in. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there were, there, there were other priests, but the high priest had to be that one uh, continually down through the time. Uh, and they represented God and people to each other. Um, and he is able to deal gently with those who are, in IV says, ignorant. I'm trying to think what year said, Doug. Year said, yours was kind of like uninformed. What was it? Is there another translation there? In verse 2, those who are spiritually ignorant. Spiritually ignorant, okay. And going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. Uh, Jesus is able to deal gently with us. I mean, we all do some, uh, I hate to use that S word, but we do some, we do some silly stuff, don't we? And we kind of even surprise ourselves sometimes. Frank? Kevin, you were talking about just exactly how high priest we have. I'm reading from Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verse 1. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. Our high priest is above the temple, not in the temple, but above the temple. He is the temple. Very good. I, I wish I, I could help us all understand just what how great and awesome of a high priest. He's the one and only. He's the, there's no other like him. And he was the perfect one. Um, kind of like asking, could God have picked something else as a sacrifice? And he couldn't. There's no, I, I think we have to realize that God picked the perfect sacrifice, the one and only that could. And I think we need to remember also that in the Old Testament, even the high priest had to offer sacrifices for himself and the other priest so they could be in a right relationship with God in order to minister to the other Israelites. Yeah. What a, I mean, put yourself in that position. How many of you would like to be a high priest? Well, you no. Know, if it's if it's going to get a lot of popularity and a lot of attention, that's good. But the responsibility that it must have been to go and represent to God the people and and the people to God uh, like in that an elder. What's that? Like an elder's position. Uh, except for even higher. So, uh, but you're right. Our shepherds look out after us, who help us, who try to gently bring us back, help us stay on the right road, do the right things. Uh, and they're compassionate and understanding and all of that. And they represent God to the people and vice versa in a lot of ways. But 
At the same time, we are a royal priesthood and we help one another. We encourage one another. Uh, he's going to say that later on in chapter 10. We come together to church to offer sacrifices, but our worship and our uh, prayers to God, we encourage one another to, to keep on keeping on. So, Fred? Uh, Fred? <laughs> uh, we'll talk more to this uh, later about Melchizedek, but uh, Jesus is both priest and king. In the Old Testament, there was a definite distinction between the priest and the royalty. And now we we uh, attain not not the great high priest level, but we <coughs> attain the level of royalty as well as priesthood. Mm -hmm. Very good. That's a, that's a that is an interesting thought. Uh, verse three. This is why he has to offer sacrifice for his own sins, as as Ken mentioned, as well as the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself. But he receives it when God call, when called by God, just as Aaron was. And the same thing is true about Jesus. He was called by the Father, and he took it upon himself. So in the same way, did Christ did not take it on himself, uh, the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. And in Scripture, I can't emphasize enough how strong of a comment that is. He's more than just a uh, a priest or whatever he is, my son, today I have become your father. And that's a quote out of Psalm chapter 2, I think, verse 7. So what a great high, high priest we have. And uh, the Hebrew writers trying to help the these Hebrew people understand what a great, amazing, perfect high priest we have through Christ. The last section, Kim's going to read for us 6 through 10, and then we'll talk about that. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was designated by God to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. All right, thank you very much. Um, I like it that the Hebrew writer said, and he says in another place. He doesn't tell you where to find it. He just says, it's in there somewhere. So if the preacher ever says, God says in another place, then that's good. Um, yes? As I was reading this, something jumped out at me. Okay. Um, uh, we're talking about the prayers, petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who would save him from death. Think back to the time when he was in Gethsemane praying. And the Bible mentions something called a bloody sweat. Uh, under intense emotional pressure, the tiny capillaries, blood vessels that we have can break and burst. And so the blood would be coming out the pores like we sweat. And that Jesus was so intense in his prayer that this was what was happening. Mm -hmm. And we have a number of prayers from Jesus that are recorded in the scripture. So that's that's a good good thought to all the one different ones that he had. Uh, we mentioned Melchizedek. I tried to put some information on the back, and that's that's very kind of a short. Is that a compact Bible encyclopedia? I think is what it's called. It was about enough words that would fit on that page, so I 
shows that. But there's a lot more information, and yet when you try to find out information about Melchizedek, it's kind of kind of hard. Uh, he was this priest in Genesis chapter four, uh, 14 that disappeared for a real short time. And uh, he didn't have any, obviously, before the law of Moses, so no lineage or no uh, type thing. Uh, and that's a little bit of the way Jesus was in that sense. But do a little bit of research, a little bit of reading on Melchizedek coming in the next few weeks, because in chapters uh, 5, 6, and 7, he's mentioned. And it's just fascinating to kind of do a little bit of research on that. But again, the great point there about while Jesus was here on earth, he was offering up prayers and petitions. And I think in some ways those are sacrifices or uh, things we can offer up as well, obviously not quite like Jesus did. But that's part of our... Jesus being our high priest, we pray like he prayed. And it's okay to cry when you pray. It's not a requirement. Uh, but it is something. Uh, and he is praying to God who could save him from life. Or from death. I think about that. Uh, I mean, there's several things in here that just seem a little bit hard to quite understand and that, but it makes sense as well that Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered that's one of them that's that's a little hard to grasp you think of the son of God had to learn obedience uh huh um, what, do you, what do you have to learn uh, especially through about? suffering I'd, I'd rather do that as a correspondence course rather than yeah, a lab. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do that at arm's length. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess this would be the human side of it that he's talking about. Uh, yeah, obviously going to the cross. Well, and, and just, um, the, just dirty his ministry, all the bickering and, and all yeah. the ridicule that he had to right. face and Especially from the from the Jewish religious leaders, mm -hmm. they, they rejected him very. It's some of that to me implied in it is that he sinned, but I, he never sinned. But he learned some things through difficulties. Maybe what it means to obey a little bit more. Uh, obedience is not easy. Yeah, and it, yeah, and as human beings learning obedience, there's a cost to obedience. Your father was quick on drawing the belt from his pants. Uh, you learned obedience through suffering. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about whatever he stayed in Jerusalem for three days and the parents went out? Don't you think he learned a little bit yeah. of obedience then as a child? Yeah, when they, when they left him behind, and yeah. What was that? Uh, as a child, Jesus, when he was left behind by his parents, you know, and they, he was there for a few days, and they went back to get him, but he uh, learned obedience on his own. I mean, his parents didn't tell him what to do. He, he learned some things there. But this idea in that it was perfecting him, and to me, this is a little interpretation. I think we learn to trust God through the difficulties we go through. I don't like going through difficulties, but being faithful and trusting God, being obedient to him, and him bringing you out on the other side of a difficult situation, learning that obedience to trust him is, is a helpful thing. Now, I don't want to go through any of that, but when I always look back on it, I say, okay, God, now I know what you were doing, and and uh, that was good. Well, Jesus kind of did that same thing, and he was made perfect, which is really more of a word for it. He was made more mature, uh, complete. You just got what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, you know, even our own kids and grandkids, uh, sometimes I think it's good for, good for them to go through some difficulties. And when I was a grandkid, I, it wasn't so uh, so good to go through those difficulties. But that is 
That is a part of life. Experiencing some things and being on the other side of something. Uh, Wiley prayed about earlier about thanks for the cold. It makes us appreciate the warmth. Well, when you go through difficulties, it makes you appreciate the good times. If everything was always good and easy all the time, you wouldn't have the mature experience of knowing what that, that is. But, but all of that was to become the source, the, the fountain, the, uh, all of that for eternal salvation for all those who obey him and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek again. So, so good stuff there about Jesus and his priesthood. And like I say, I think for us, we struggle with understanding why should there be a priesthood? Why should there be a priest? That whole priest, well, sacrifices and all that system. And I don't know but what that was a part of the, the old law leading us to Jesus and understanding what sacrifice really was. He was the spotless lamb of God. He was, he was the perfect one for sacrifice. So uh, I, I think a lot of that is real key to start understanding and grasping the priesthood. Oh, I, I think I understand right that Jesus was compared to Melchizedek because God collected him. Yes. He wasn't of any lineage. Okay. Right. But is there something about Melchizedek other than that that, that we should learn about Jesus? Well, I mean, he, he came to Abraham. Right. And took care of him. And I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of mystery and even uh, people looking. There are people who speculate that Melchizedek was just God in the flesh. There are people who think, no, that was Jesus. And uh, I think this article may have even approached some of those uh, questions. <laughs> we don't know a lot about him, but then he is kind of mysterious and, and all of that. So, so Jerry? When you get to chapter 7, you find out that not only was Melchizedek a priest, but he's also a king. Yeah, and that, that's kind of what... And that ties to, to Christ, yeah. too. So it's uh, it's fascinating. So I would say, I don't want to say there's not more we can learn, because I feel like there is, but I don't know what that is. Because I he's always been kind of a mystery to me, and I think he remains that. Maybe, there's, maybe that is part of it, too. So. All right. Andy, would you come and pray?